This video is going to take you through chapter 38, which is the conservation biology chapter. I've already given you everything you need for why should you be concerned about the current loss of biodiversity, but just some things that I kind of wanted to show you. One of the problems that humans have is a litter issue. Um, plastic is an amazing thing that is basically never going to decompose, and yet we make all of our products that are disposable out of plastic, and that plastic has to go somewhere. So this is showing just essentially an island of plastic garbage washing up onto a beach, and that's just not how, it's not sustainable. It's not how you want to live your life. You wouldn't want to sit there and go on vacation to this beach. You wouldn't want to live next to that beach. Think about what that does to the animals that are in that area too. Um, you should be concerned because one of the things that we're doing is driving multiple species to extinction. Tigers are one of those creatures. I've already given you the whole story on the rivet popper, so you're good there. Um, this video will also help explain why you should be concerned and how different organisms interact. In Peru, along the base of the Andes Mountains, lies the Manu Biosphere Reserve. Covering about four and a half million acres, it's the largest and most undisturbed tropical rainforest in the world. Here, more species of plants and animals are protected than in almost any other place on Earth. Around a thousand species of bird, 300 kinds of trees, and countless other forms of life called Manu home. They rely on each other and the resources of this land to survive. Living organisms thrive in the biome because conditions for life are ideal. The climate is wet, the temperature is warm, and the sunlight provides constant energy. Trees grow tall here and form a canopy that collects energy from the sun. As a result, most of the food for plant-eating animals grows far above the ground. To find food, animals must fly, leap, swing, and climb to get the food they need. Zoologist Dr. Carol Mitchell has been studying monkeys in the Manu rainforest for 12 years. For two of those years, she followed a troop of about 70 squirrel monkeys. She learned how they gather food and where they fit into the larger food web. I actually had always wanted to uh, study monkeys, and I was always intrigued by tropical forests. And in tropical forests, you find the greatest diversity of animal species. She quickly discovered that squirrel monkeys don't work alone. Instead, they get the nutrients they need by associating with another species, the capuchin monkey. Capuchins are the only animal which can open up the initial part of the palm cluster. And the squirrel monkeys hang around underneath and pick up nuts which are half eaten by the capuchins. It's a smart strategy. Palm nuts enhance their diet by giving them an important source of oil and calories. Squirrel monkeys consume a richer variety of food by scavenging around the capuchins. During her time with the squirrel monkeys, Dr. Mitchell determined their place in the intricate ecology of the rainforest. Squirrel monkeys are very crucial in the web of life. They are uh, one of the prime consumers of insects in the rainforest and also they are one of the main food sources for a number of raptor species. Scientists monitor all areas of the rainforest to see how each species contributes to such a complex environment. And while it may seem like a whole lot of work to spend so much time with a single species, they have a bigger picture in mind. Unless we understand and care for places like Manu, their incredible environments won't be preserved for the future. All right, so why loss matters. 
Um, one of the things that humans do is we deforest, and unfortunately when you remove a forest, you remove the habitat for all the things that lived in that forest. There was a video uh, last summer that showed an orangutan that was sort of aggressively charging at a bulldozer that was deforesting his home. That's a real life thing for them. When you bulldoze a forest, you just completely obliterated the homes for all those things that used to live there. Um, those parts you already have, I believe, and oh wait, nope, you do need to get those parts. So um, we talked about extinction in previous chapters. We'll talk about poaching more again here in just a minute. We'll talk about climate change more later on too, but loss of habitat is a big one. If you take away the habitat, you have taken away everything that they need for survival. Extirpation is loss of a species in a particular area. This video is showing you a horny toad, which used to be super common in our area in Texas, but because of the red imported fire ant, you rarely find them around here anymore, so they've been extirpated from our area. Extinction is different. It's loss of a species from the planet. Um, elephant birds, which is what I'm showing you here to the left of the, I'm going to call him a Neanderthal, but I'm not really sure where he would fit in the taxonomy. Um, passenger pigeons were extinct locally in the United States back in the early 1900s, and so extinction has gone forever. It's a little bit different from ecologically extinct, which means there's so few of them left that they don't perform their niche anymore. Generally speaking, though, when you hear somebody say something's extinct, it means it's gone. We can't find them anymore. Um, some examples of biodiversity loss, you already have stuff written down, so just quickly mentioning the pangolin is considered to be the most trafficked slash poached animal in the world. They're a mammal that is poached for their scale because certain cultures believe that those scales can do everything from cure baldness to cure cancer. Um, this was a haul. It was caught as the animals had already been poached, unfortunately. Their scales had been plucked. All of these piles and bags are pangolin scales. You can imagine how many pangolins had to die in order to fill all of these bags, but this haul got confiscated as it was being shipped from wherever these particular pangolins came from. They were probably African, but there are species that live in Indonesia as well. Um, but you can see why they're on the endangered species list. If you have to kill this many of them to get scales, it's going to wipe the species out fairly quickly. Um, one of the reasons to be concerned about the loss of genetic diversity is that as you lose genes, you lose the products of those genes. So for example, insulin is coded for by a gene. If that gene no longer existed, we would have a bunch of diabetics and no treatment for those diabetics. Um, a more local example that I'm giving you, this is foxglove. It is a plant that you can find around here. Well, the drug digitalis, which get, gets used to treat people after they've had a heart attack, it comes from foxgloves. So if people had just mowed down all the fields and planted a bunch of grass, we wouldn't have digitalis because the foxglove would have been wiped out. Um, the threats to biodiversity, number one is habitat loss. As humans move into new places and we build houses in those places, we destroy the habitat for the things that used to live there. Just think about the road between Cleburne and Burleson that goes through Joshua. That used to be ranch land and there used to be things like mountain lions and coyotes that lived back there. Now they're building all of these subdivisions and putting up all of these stoplights and everything that used to live there, it's either going to die or it's going to have to move someplace else. Um, invasive species are another one. They're also called introduced species. We talked about the brown-headed cowbird in a previous chapter. It was part of the reason why the golden-cheeked warbler had been listed as an endangered species. This is just to show you that not all endangered species are animals. This is kudzu. It is an invasive plant that grows so fast it can smother trees by blocking their sunlight and preventing the trees from carrying out photosynthesis. Um, humans, uh, Americans, I should say, we have a military base on Guam. Um, as we were shipping things to and fro for our military, one of the things that hitched a ride at some point was this brown tree snake. Um, this snake eats small animals and it eats eggs, and the birds that lived on Guam were not used to that as a predator, so they didn't know how to protect themselves against it. And so a lot of the birds in Guam, some of them went extinct, a bunch of them are critically endangered, all because of an introduced species that we unfortunately took to that island. Now here's another video to explain introduced species to you. Ah, oh, darn, it helps if I hit the right button. The islands of Galapagos, located about 600 miles west of Ecuador, are famous for their unspoiled beauty and unusual animal life. Creatures like giant tortoises, flightless cormorants, 
and swimming marine iguanas evolved in relative isolation here. But these conditions have changed dramatically on several islands of Galapagos in recent years. Today, more than 15,000 people are permitted to live in designated areas. Daily flights arrive, carrying visitors eager to explore the untouched land. While people bring money used to preserve the island's natural state, they also introduce other items that harm its fragile ecology. Paleontologist Dr. David Stedman explains. Even in a place seemingly as remote as Galapagos, I mean, there are more than 50,000 tourists a year coming, coming out here. So uh, the beach we're sitting on Boy, what a wonderful beach. It looks great. And within a 50-foot radius of us here, you know, you could pick up a thousand pieces of garbage. Now, garbage in itself maybe doesn't cause extinction, but nevertheless, it represents a type of human impact. Today, the biggest threat to native populations come from introduced species. Dogs and cats, farm animals, and rats arrived on ships over the years. When they get on islands, they're just cut loose. There's virtually no check on their populations, so their numbers grow rapidly, and they have devastating effects on the vegetation. They also have a devastating effect on animal populations. One population especially threatened is the giant tortoise. In an effort to protect them, wardens from the National Park dig up their eggs as soon as they are laid and bring them to the Charles Darwin Station. Here, they are supervised and kept out of harm's way until the tortoises are big enough to survive on their own. These are three-year-old tortoises from the island of Santiago. Uh, Santiago is an island that has a lot of problems with the introduced species, and so even though there's a wild population of tortoises there that in fact can lay eggs in the wild, the eggs are eaten especially by rats and pigs. Once the tortoises hatch, they are raised here until they are four or five years old. By one year old, these tortoises are, are sort of rat proof. So a rat can't hurt a tortoise after it's about a year old. But on Santiago, with the, all the feral pigs they have, they have thousands of feral pigs on Santiago. The tortoises, these poor little baby tortoises, need to be about four or five years old before they're pig proof. So this is a good example of very active hands-on manipulation of a wild population in order to keep it going. When new organisms are introduced into an existing ecosystem, they create different, sometimes harmful, links in the food web. Often, with added competition, native species cannot survive. Scientists like David Stedman monitor places that are changing in an effort to influence the chain of events and protect the natural environment. Next step, you have over harvesting. This means that it's something that it's a population that you're trying to manage, but people are taking more than they are allowed to take. So this would be like you're allowed to shoot three deer during hunting season, but instead you kill five deer during hunting season. Over harvesting is what made the passenger pigeon go extinct. Um, this was a North American bird that the flocks used to be so big that they would literally darken the sky like it would turn to night in the daytime as the flock flew overhead so people thought that there were so many of them they could kill as many as they wanted and then the population crashed and now they're extinct the atlantic cod fishery is also in danger because of over harvesting the pacific side is doing okay but the atlantic cod fishery um, is not managed as well as the Pacific side. Um, I think there's a gross picture on the next slide. It's a disturbing picture, so I wanted to warn you about it. Um, poaching is what you guys have next. It's a type of over-harvesting. Poaching means that you are illegally killing an animal, so it is illegal to kill elephants, and yet they are poached in Africa for their tusks. Um, what's really sad about that is they, they kill the animal and then chainsaw their face off because all they want is the face. They don't want the meat. They don't want the organs. All they wanted were the tusks that were on that animal. And so that's what happened to this elephant. Um, poaching also affects other species. And here's the problem that is associated with poaching that more people are going to care about, especially right now with COVID-19. 
COVID-19 is believed to have jumped to the human population because a human ate something that should not have been eaten. So they ate a poached animal. There's debate ongoing about whether or not the animal that was eaten was a bat or a pangolin, but whatever it was, they ate something that they shouldn't. Anytime we eat something that can transmit disease to human beings, that is bad for our population as a whole, not to mention bad for theirs. It's especially bad when you hunt things that are kind of closely related to us, like primates. Um, it is believed that HIV got into the human population because of a disease that's called simian immunodeficiency, um, which is something that chimps and apes can get. And so as a poacher was preparing their meat from either a chimp or a gorilla, the blood of that animal got onto them and the virus was closely enough related that it was able to jump into people and then start causing disease in those people. So poaching is never a good idea. Climate change is also affecting species. So this picture is a polar bear that is quite literally starving to death because there was no ice in his area during the winter that year and they need ice in order to hunt. Uh, the photographer who took this picture talked about how heartbroken he was to see this because he had food in theory he could feed the polar bear except it's illegal for you to do that you're not allowed to feed the wildlife um, it tends to make them more dependent on people and with polar bears that's bad because they are murdery little bears um, they can't go farther north they're already as far north as you can get so there's not enough ice flow for them to be able to survive down here anymore next up ozone layer isn't talked about all that much anymore back during the 80s and 90s you couldn't couldn't fix your hair without hearing about it um, and that's because propellants that were used in things like hairspray they were made out of CFCs which are chlorofluorocarbons and those bind with the ozone that is up in the atmosphere and they convert it to a different molecule so it created this hole in the ozone layer and the ozone layer is a protective layer that's up in the upper atmosphere that prevents some sunlight from hitting the earth so that it helped to keep us nice and cool well the hole allows more sunlight in in that area and so it's one of the things that can be contributing to the increase in temperature that's happening right now. Um, although the hole is starting to heal itself, it is still there. You guys already have biological magnification um, written down and you have examples of that. Um, you already have your how is the climate changing thing written down. This GIF always takes a second to load, but what this is going to show you is average temperature during the course of the year since we began recording temperatures. What I want you to notice is how much wider that circle gets as we get closer to the time period that we're in now. So when it was really narrow, it was about a degree and a half cooler than it is in our most recent time. And so this shows you quite clearly, it is definitely getting warmer out there. Um, let's see, this I'm going to show you a video to help kind of debunk some of the... Next up we have which human activities are impacting the climate. The primary thing that we're doing that impacts the climate is we're burning fossil fuels that adds carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. And as a video that I'm linking to in Schoology for you guys shows you, when you increase carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, you increase the average temperature on the planet as a whole. Next up, um, how will biomes change? You guys already have that in the notes. What has happened to the wildfire season? It's building hotter, it's burning longer, and the fires are burning more intensely. If you guys remember the campfire that happened last year, um, PG&E's power lines hadn't been properly maintained and it sparked a fire and that fire per, uh, burned down the entire town of Paradise. That is an example of a fire that's burning hot, hotter and more intensely than fires in the past used to do. Um, if you paid attention to the news, 2020 started with basically most of Australia being on fire and that's because of the increase in the intensity of the wildfire season, not just in the Northern Hemisphere, but all over the world. Um, what is the impact going to be on uh, animals in relation to climate change? Generally speaking, animals have mobility so they can move to more suitable habitats if a more suitable habitat is available to them. As we already talked about with the polar bear, they don't really have another option. They're screwed and that's one of the reasons why they are in danger right now. Um, are all animals going to suffer? No. One of the things that's actually winning because of climate change is mosquitoes are able to extend their range and they take their diseases with them. This gentleman has dengue fever, which is a mosquito vectored uh, viral infection that can happen. And what's extra scary about dengue is if you get it a second time, you are more likely to have more intense symptoms, including death, the second time you get that infection than you had the first time around. Um, what are the goals of conservation biology? To try to save the planet, save people, save the species that are on the planet. Um, pause it so that you can get that definition. Same for landscape ecology. For movement corridor, I will slow down. 
Movement corridors allow animals to move from one place to another place without messing around with people too much. If it weren't for movement corridors, they would be doing things like using our roads to get from point A to point B. And as we know, people in cars versus animals don't usually fare very well for the animals nor for the cars that we hit them with. Um, Bant, for example, there's this is in Canada, they have moose, and if you've never seen what a moose does to a car, I don't recommend YouTubing it, because they will obliterate a car and end up inside the car at the end of the wreck. So they make these bridges that allow moose to cross from one side to the other so that they don't get hit by cars instead. Um, here's your definition of hotspots. United States only has a couple of places, the places that burn in California, and then the swamps in Florida are hotspots in the U.S. All the purple regions are hotspots. Madagascar is a hotspot because it has some of the most unique endemic species out of anywhere on the planet, essentially. Um, endemic species I just mentioned, but these are species that are found no place else on Earth, like lemurs are endemic to Madagascar. Um, we have an endemic species here in Texas that's called noseburn, trage and nigricans. Um, it's called noseburn because if you touch the plant like this gentleman is doing and then kind of inadvertently brush your nose or wipe your nose or something, it will be like you got tear gassed but in your nose. It's not very pleasant when you touch it. So I love that Texas has endemic species that make you really kind of want to hate them. Uh, you guys already have the definition for zone reserves. Ecotourism is when a vacationer spends money in an area and they use that money to try to help the animals and plants that live in that area. Like if you go to China and you pay money to go see one of their panda breeding facilities, they use that money to breed more pandas. And so that's a type of ecotourism. Um, here's your definition for restoration ecology. Pause it if you need to. And then sustainable development. We've talked about that in chapters before. What you need to do next is complete an assignment and you're going to have three options. Pick whichever one you want. You can do a presentation on an endangered species. Uh, you can do the Wild Watch Kenya thing that I described to you guys in the notes. Or you can do a soccer team quiz that I'm going to link to in the updates in Schoology for you guys. Email me to let me know which option you're choosing to do. And then once you get your results done, I can know where I'm supposed to look for that option. Thank you.